Okay, welcome to Ranger Strength Podcast, episode 16. Uh, with us today, we are very lucky to have Olivia Allnut. She is co-director of Stretch Therapy. Um, for those of you who have been listening to our podcast episodes previous, um, Stretch Therapy is Kit Laughlin's uh, organization. Olivia is uh, his partner in crime, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, with that organization. And uh, we're so happy to have you on. Thank you for joining us today, Olivia. Well, thanks for inviting me. I'm very pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you too. Cool. Uh, we have uh, a few things we're excited to get into. Um, mm -hmm. But before we begin, um, it would be really nice to hear your background and story. Like maybe if you want to go way back to, I know you you have a heavy gymnastics history, things like that. I do. Um, yep. Kind of, you know, just give our listeners and Jeff and I really excited to hear your story as sure. well. Uh, okay. A little background on how this all came to be. That would be great. All right. Well, I'm Australian. I grew up in Canberra, capital city, with my brother and my parents. And, you know, nice, comfortable middle class background. Went to a nice school, great education, lots of opportunity. So, in terms of sport, I did start gymnastics at about five and a half, six, and I trained through till about 17. And I also coached for a long time and was a judge. So gymnastics was a big part of my life for a long time. Absolutely loved it. But I was also involved in lots of other sports. I played field hockey in the winter, softball in the summer, um, played a lot of tennis. My dad was a very good ten tennis and table tennis player. So we learned tennis, um, cross country running, swimming. So lots and lots of sport all my life. Um, and also a lot of music. We all played the piano and played the flute and was involved in all that sort of stuff as well. But sport was probably the big part of my life. Um, and then I finished school and I spent a year overseas working in the UK and travelling. And I did no sport for a whole year. I got fat, really fat. I put on 20 kilos and did nothing. Totally different lifestyle. And then I came back to Australia, to Canberra and to do university Originally, I was planning to study sports journalism, but I changed my mind and I went to the Australian National University and I did an arts science degree there. Arts was English and political science. And on the science side, I was part of the human ecology program. And that is where I met Kit. He was doing his PhD research in that department. And so there was one tutorial I went along to and he was the tutor on that particular day he wasn't my regular tutor and for some reason at the end of that tutorial we all started discussing the part-time work we were doing to support ourselves through university and everyone else in the room worked in hospitality and I said well I'm working as a gymnastics coach and Kit said oh that's interesting I run some stretching classes over at the sports union maybe you want to come and try them out and I did and it went from there. That's way back in 1993, so a long time ago now. And I just gradually became more and more and more immersed in stretch therapy. It wasn't called stretch therapy then. It used to be called posture and flexibility. And we ran a facility there for 27 years. We had a bunch of teachers, thousands and thousands of students. And I, as I said, just got more and more and more involved in the world of stretch therapy. Mm -hmm. I had a, a job in the government at the same time. I worked for the Department of Defence for a long time. And then I left that career and worked in the not-for-profit sector in the communications area. So that's where I learned all the bits and pieces of running a business. And that was great training for becoming the main administrator type person in our now two-person stretch therapy company. Um, and so just over time, I became... I did less of the other work and now full-time in stretch therapy for a long period of time. And we closed that gym in Canberra in 2013 and left Canberra. And now we live in a little fishing village south of Sydney and we have a teaching centre and a production centre downstairs. And we also have focused mainly on travelling the world, delivering face-to-face -face workshops. So that's my background in terms of stretch therapy. I would say next to Kit... I'm the, the person on the planet most immersed in the stretch therapy world because of all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, and I love it. I love teaching. I don't particularly like teaching workshops just because I'm naturally a very nervous kind of person. I'm not a natural presenter like Kid is. But 
nonetheless, I've persevered and I've gotten used to that. But what I really love is teaching classes, which I've done for many, many, many years. Um, and yeah, so that's my background and that's what we're doing right now. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Um, <laughs> and you guys are doing amazing things like, you know, yeah. So I'm, just, I'm in Nova Scotia, like really far, far apart of Canada and Jeffrey's in Florida, like having oh, okay. a huge impact globally. You guys are like, yeah. you know, well, it's cool. really amazing. Hoping to get to a workshop, you know, at some point, uh, get some teacher training and you guys don't come to Canada as much. I know you were coming to BC. Um, yeah. Regularly. Well, brand new world, given current circumstances, like yeah. everyone else, we're pivoting. We don't really know how much more face-to-face stuff we will do. Mm-hmm. Um, I will definitely go back to Canada as soon as I can. I absolutely love Canada. I've been to Nova Scotia. I actually spent five months traveling across Canada by myself way back in the day. I just love it. Um, so, yeah, we would love to see you at a workshop and maybe we will recraft our offerings to do as much as possible online. I don't personally think that you can substitute 100% online training from what you would learn face-to-face, yeah. but, you know, current circumstances, you just have to pivot and, and do what you can. That's yeah. amazing. Um, yeah. One thing that kind of, like, stands out, which I wanted to dive into at some point in the conversation as well too, is, uh, you know, mentioning that you, your gymnastics coach and Kit saying, okay, I, I do flexibility class. And then there's like that connection. Mm. Um, it would be interesting to kind of hear your perspectives on having such a thorough gymnastic background where flexibility does play a very large role and how, that has evolved and or changed maybe some Mm -hmm. of your thought processes at that time, like over Mm -hmm. time, because there is kind of, um, you know, sometimes uh, it's that you're brought up in the sport and you're kind of flexible from the big, from the beginning, Mm -hmm. and that's how you kind of make it. Like my kids were in gymnastics, you know, introductory kind of stuff. And I was watching how they were kind of picking kids from the litter, like, Oh, you're you're flexible. You're, you, (laughs) you're strong. And those kids kind of went on. Yeah. Um, so it would be really interesting to hear your perspectives on like how that journey, you know, you met with Kit and then as a gymnastics coach, mm-hmm. were there any like eye opening moments or, or thought processes or that really changed and evolved? Mm-hmm. Definitely. Well, so yeah, I mean, typically gym, gymnasts start young. I was five and a half and, you know, it's kind of just general activity and fun and games and, you know, exploring your body and that kind of thing to begin with and then you decide whether you get a bit more serious and then the programming all gets a bit more structured I I did gymnastics it's never particularly good Uh, you know it just was club level big part of my life Um, I would say there was a, a a pretty even mix between you did some flexibility training but as a child you didn't really see it that way you were just doing the stretches that they told you to do and there was nothing sophisticated about it at all we just did it um, but you also did lots of strength training drills and then of course you did the school work and it was all just part of what you were you, you were doing um, when I started coaching you, you think about it in a different way because you're trying to teach other children this is all in the context of working with children um, and in my own body, I would say I was kind of 50-50 good at flexibility and good at strength. There was no, I was not particularly flexible or particularly strong. It was a nice mix. And I, that has actually served me well as I've gotten older in terms of, you know, functioning well. I don't really have any physical problems in my body. So when I came to, we'll call it stretch therapy at the ANU, the classes that Kit was running, um, I came in with this idea, well, I'm already flexible. But what I found was that I actually had all sorts of flexibility limitations because you would know this from working with your athletes. Any athletic pursuit um, confers a particular pattern of flexibility, pattern of strength, pattern of skills um, on that individual body. And so whilst I was flexible on any absolute scale and I'd had all these years of experience doing flexibility training in the gymnastics setting, Um, there were ranges of movement in my body that were extremely tight. And on the strength side, the other end of the the physical spectrum, there were parts of my body that were very strong and parts that were very, very weak. 
And so one of the things that we impress upon anyone that comes into stretch therapy is you need to work out where the limitations are in your body. So in the flexibility side, where are the restrictions? Where are the locked up parts? And on the strength side, where are the bits that are not active and so then they can't be strong? And, of course, there's a direct relationship between those things. Um, So what I did when I came to stretch therapy, thinking that I was already flexible and had good balance and all this stuff, because beam was actually, the balance beam was my best apparatus in gymnastics, I found all the bits that I sucked at, the bits that were tight, my balance actually wasn't very good, and the strength limitations. And so all I did for the first four, five, six years of being involved with stretch therapy was identify the restrictions and the weak parts and work on them. And the reason I mention that is I trained with a group of people in the gymnastics arena and we were there from the beginning five and a half all the way through to we all retired and of my cohort I was the only one that had zero physical problems lots of them had ongoing back problems those sorts of things I had none of that and I have never had any of that and now I'm you know pushing 50 and I really think it's because I did that work of looking at the restrictions and the strength deficits and just working on them So I commend that to anyone that's listening, anyone that's interested in doing the fancy stuff, that's all nice, but do the foundational stuff as well. Because what stretch therapy is really about is helping people find grace and ease in their body in day-to-day life, which the vast majority of people, adults in the West, they don't experience their life in their body in that way. They just don't. And it doesn't sound very sexy, but really it's the best thing you can have in your life is feeling comfortable in your body day to day. So that is what stretch therapy is really all about. Mm -hmm. Identifying what your individual body needs right now. And that will change as you age. The things that I focus on now in my own physical practice are completely different to what I did 30 years ago, just completely different. But the key thing that I found in stretch therapy, and this goes back to your question about the difference between, you know, your gymnastics career. Um, In the gymnastics world, you're doing the stuff and you're learning and it's great and you're a young person, but you're not really attending to any of that other stuff. You're just pursuing the sport because you love it and you love the environment. Um, A lot of people we find as adults, they don't have very good connections to their body at all. That's what we found. All those students we worked with in Canberra all those years, they would come in with no real physical connection to their body, no real awareness, no idea of where are the restrictions, just a general idea that, you know, they could probably feel more comfortable if they did a little bit of stretching exercise. And I want to introduce another idea about here about the idea of a beginner because we've had some interesting conversations recently with a couple of different people about how they reacted very negatively to the idea of being a beginner. And I find that very interesting because being a beginner is gold. I mean, everyone's a beginner when you start a new activity. Everyone's a beginner. So going back to that facility at Canberra, we had beginner flexibility classes, then we had intermediate, then we had advanced. And beginner simply meant to us that you'd never done the stretch therapy classes. And it didn't matter who you were. It didn't matter if you were a top level swimmer or whatever. If you wanted to come along and do stretch therapy, you would start as a beginner because you wanted to learn the techniques we use, the language we use. You had an uh, opportunity to do exercises for all of the body. And this is all going back to that point about finding out what your individual body needs. And so everyone came in as a beginner and I I commend this to athletes here that are listening because I know you guys work a lot with athletes. Go back to the basics. Go back to the beginner with no idea about what I can and can't already do and just experience these very simple exercises if if it's flexibility we're talking about and you want to get involved in stretch therapy and feel what it feels like. Approach it from a a beginner mindset of, I haven't done this before, I don't know what it will feel like, and just feel what it feels like. Mm -hmm. I'm darting around a whole lot of comments here, but 
really stretch therapy is an approach to working with the body with no regard for what the outcome might be. It's experiencing what it feels like to do these basic movements. And when you identify something that doesn't feel good or something that's restricted, whatever it might be, how can you change that? How can you change that? Not someone else um, changing it for you, but you working out how to change it. Mm -hmm. Um, That process of exploration, which might take years, this is another thing. A lot of people are in a great hurry. They want to be able to do X in four weeks or six weeks. Um, In our experience, as an adult, it's not a reasonable expectation to become super flexible in a very short period of time. It's not our experience with adults. There'll be exceptions, of course, but lots of people, it takes a lot more time than that. Um, I'll give you one little anecdote that I heard from one of our uh, students in Europe. He came to a couple of workshops in London. He's a Spanish guy based in um, Barcelona, I believe. And he's just been working away diligently week by week with the exercises that he learned from us. And he wrote to me last week and said, I did the work. I listened to your ideas about how I just keep doing the work and then, you know, something someday you'll recognise there's been a change. And he said, about six months ago, I got down on the floor and I did some of the hip flexor stretches and I felt in my body that there was a fundamental change. And in the six months between that point and now, he said, that flexibility is mine. It's available to me anytime, cold. But he didn't know that at the beginning. He just took our advice, did the work, and that's been his experience. And so I recommend that, again, to anyone listening here, just do the exercises, keep doing the exercises, and you will notice change. Exactly when, I can't tell you. It's an absolutely individual thing. But just get started. Do the work. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Because another thing that we get all the time is, well, What's the programming? What's the sequence I need to do? How often? What intensity? All that kind of stuff. And we can give all sorts of recommendations about that, but you have to just start, do the work and work out what works for you. And it will, it might be that the techniques and the intensity and the duration and all those parameters are different around your body, are different over time. Um, yeah. Yeah. I make a whole lot of different points here, but they're really important points in in our experience. Absolutely. In this yeah. enterprise of just trying to help as many people as possible feel more comfortable in their body. Feel more comfortable. Yeah, that's the starting point. And you did say that you did stay into gymnastics for a long time as well as like a judge. Yeah, so that was all. I trained and then I started yeah. um coaching and judging from 13 through to around early 20s. Um, I I love that world, but I didn't particularly like coaching children. So it was a very nice fit for me to find stretch therapy and start working with adults. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm. Um, Yeah, and and it's it's so funny. You're hitting all the topics that Jeff and I often uh, speak in regards to and people like doing what they're good at. You know, you play sports, you get good at sports. So I'm going to continue to do this and I won't really think of certain aspects of my body until it starts breaking down and it's kind of too late That's for a lot of people at some point, but Mm. you know, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, that's part of it as well as that beginner mindset, like knowing that, yeah, you have to really adopt that you're Mm. learning something brand new. And for the most part, a lot of people haven't stretched <laughs> like really actually had done a stretch before. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, that's, that's a, a beautiful way to put it. And uh, Jeff, Jeff really has made a huge impact at ATG um, with his work on athletes. And that's been, I would say like the primary role there too, right? Jeff is just taking those athletes when they come in and making them adopt that beginner mindset. Yeah, I mean, it's been quite a unique experience because, you know, my training background previously was personal training, general population, a lot of, you know, I don't want to say older, but middle-aged, too older, successful, you know, that kind of crowd. Um, 
-hmm. And I did that for such a long time. But then when I started at ATG, um, I shifted from basically working with kids, teenage, sometimes younger, um, but then mostly we got into collegiate pro athletes. Um, and it was an interesting experience for me because the, this is a group of people that will do almost anything and a lot of times too much to achieve certain goals. Mm -hmm. but, to, but to get them to stretch was probably one of the most fascinating experiences because in the athletic world and in terms of team athletes, like team sports, especially in the West here in the United States, you just don't do it. You just don't do it. And so, <laughs> you know, you do like, you might go on the field and you'll do some kicks and, you know, baseball, you do a couple side bins like PE class and that you're good to go. Like that's the stretching that you do. Yeah. And then, you know, they come in and I, I remember the first week I, I actually was teaching some classes at ATG and I had about, 20 to 30, mostly guys in there, uh, a lot of football players and stuff like that. And they, I had all my, I had some times written up on the board for them to expect. And they saw a stretch, a couple stretches that were up there for like a couple minutes, which um, to me is not even a lot, you know, cause I'll sit in a stretch for sometimes 10, 12, yeah. sometimes 15 minutes, just depending on how I'm feeling. And um, just, you know, the first question was like two minutes, you know, like, I thought stretching was like 30 seconds and you're done, you know? And it's like, mm -hmm. I just remember the smile that came out of my face. Like you guys are about to have an experience like you've never had before. And yeah. <laughs> what was interesting was after the first session, they were in, they were bought in and mm -hmm. it was cool because a lot of them did. They had that kind of skepticism at first. Um, but one session and that was, okay, man, I, I, I need this, you know? And, and, and it's, it's, it's surprising to me. And, and Lucas, I know, deals with this too. Um, you know, he comes from a powerlifting background predominantly. I mean, he's done tons of other things as well. I'm sure he can talk about, but um, it's surprising to me because people will come here, our experience with like what I deal with, they'll come in with knee pain, ankle, shoulders, back, you name it, um, but never have stretched those areas. But then a lot of the information that these athletes are given is that that stretching is bad for you. And I don't know if you guys really experience that as much as we do, but I deal with that every day. Well, I was told stretching is bad for you. I was told that stretching is worthless and it's pointless and all these different things. And mm -hmm. then you get them to stretch and it's like, you have knee pain. You, you cannot take your knee past 90 degrees. Like your quads are so tight. Mm -hmm. You literally can't bend your knee and you wonder why you have knee pain, but you're told stretching is bad for you. And it's just like a bizarre world to live in because it's, mm -hmm. you know, I was one of those that when I was a baseball player, yeah, and I was, I was all messed up from, from rotating. And that's pretty much the only sport I played. I didn't play any other sports. So for 14 years, you know, three quarters of the year, I'm rotating to the left constantly. That's all I knew how to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so stretching was an experience for me because I didn't really experience issues until after baseball, when I started getting into CrossFit and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And that's when the stuff started showing up is these severe imbalances. And the only, at the only, the only thing I had exposure to at that point, like anybody in CrossFit was, you know, Kelly Starrett and, and the Supple Leopard and that kind of whole, his ideology, mm -hmm. which didn't work for me. And then eventually found um, coach Summers and through coach Summers found Kit. And then, mm -hmm. you know, basically through Kit found Emmett and, kind of went from there so um yeah yeah it's, just it's hard to find it's hard to find all where every like all the mentors and leaders are at in flexibility it's yeah. it's not it's yeah, getting yeah. better right but yeah yeah when, when you want to start going deeper into it it's like mm -hmm. it's it's getting better but yeah it was quite a journey to when mm -hmm. you start embarking on it to you know yeah. figure out where where are those answers lie and and you know the truths and myths kind of try to dispel. Yeah. Well, I'll make a couple of comments about the, the athletes. So in, um, in Canberra, we have our Institute of Sport, the National Institute of Sport. And Kit and I both independently did some work in that facility with groups of athletes. But there was one particular time I went and did a couple of um, 
practical stretching sessions with a group of people who were in their final year of their strength and conditioning degree. So they were training to be professionals who would then go on to work with sporting teams, you know, whether they did physio or just strength and conditioning or whatever it was. And again, I was there to show them how to do the stretching as we understood from all of our experience. But this group as a whole, they didn't want to do any of the stretching themselves. They just wanted to learn about the theory of it. They wanted to talk about it. So my point here is that they themselves had never done any stretching and they were completely resistant to doing any of it. And when I did finally get them down and said, look, I don't want to talk about the theory. I want to give you practical experience here. They realised how much they didn't know anything about stretching from that experiential perspective. So how can you then go and teach that to an athlete when you have no experience of it yourself? Mm -hmm. So I think that's why what you said, Jeffrey. a lot of people go through an athletic career and they have a a skill set, a, a talent for something, and they get by because they're, you know, naturally good at that activity. And then it's, you know, they might get an injury or something prevents them going further, but it's when they stop that they realise, you know, there's some real limitations in their body. And because they never had any experience of stretching or flexibility training in their athletic career, they don't think of that as something I will then pursue to repair myself after I stop. Um, and the other thing that I noticed, particularly at the Institute of Sport, is that those athletes had access to all sorts of professionals, physios, you know, all these other treatments, which they just got on a table, had a TENS machine or whatever it was, and someone else was going to repair them. That was what they had access to. So they didn't learn how to stretch. They didn't know how to do it. And if something was going wrong in their body that was preventing them doing their sport, someone else fixed them. That's not the stretch therapy approach. The stretch therapy approach is working out how you can fix and improve. And these are all negative words, how you can help yourself. That's what it's about. Yeah. Yeah. It, but, it's Lucas and I got an interesting question the other day from a member. We were doing an IG live and a guy who's a volleyball coach, he asked us, he said, you know, I know stretching is important and I tell my athletes it's important, but I know they don't do it. How do I get my athletes to stretch? And uh, Lucas and I's answer was, was exactly the same. And from where we stand, it's you have to show up and do the work and you have to lead the charge by showing that you do that work and that you can display it. And there's almost no questions. I, like, I don't get the resistance and Lucas doesn't get the resistance because we show it. We, we show up and we do it right alongside of you. Mm -hmm. So when somebody asks me, you know, how do you get somebody else to do it? Well, you got to do it first. And then when they see you doing it and they see you, you know, your success and those kind of things, they're, they're not going to ask any questions usually, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. So, you know, that's, that's what we try to tell people. And I think this probably segues to an interesting question is, my first experience with stretching was a yoga, like most people. Um, you know, I know it's hard to put anything under an umbrella, but by this point, there's thousands mm -hmm. of different variations and teachers and all these things. But mm -hmm. as, a, as a male, if I went to a yoga class and I went to several for a long time when I lived in New York City and I did CrossFit, I just literally just felt like I was wasting my time. I was there and just, I couldn't do the positions. I couldn't you know, all these girls are in there and they're just doing all this crazy stuff. And there I am just going, I'm just, I look like a creep because I'm just standing there looking because I literally can't do any of the stuff, yeah. but yeah. I was never given options. Um, and, you know, maybe you can talk a little bit about your experience mm. with, with kids and adults in the difference. You know, we, we know kids thoughts on that, but then maybe also your experience with, with how you guys teach the system because you guys kind of have mastered flexibility for adults, which a lot of flexibility training traditionally comes from, again, people who have developed it as a kid. And what I found in my experience when I've worked with those people is they don't know how to get me flexible or most adults flexible. They just happen to have it and they mm. teach you what they learned when they were young gymnasts or young dancers or whatever. And that may not translate exactly to other adults. So maybe you could talk a little bit about 
your experience between those. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, so my personal background, as I described before, is I did work a long time with children and I came through a lot of flexibility work as a child myself and adolescent. But in the stretch therapy context, we only work with adults, so 18 plus. Um, and Kit himself, you've heard his background. He had zero flexibility, all sorts of problems in his body. And he was trying to work out how do I get flexible as an adult? So in, in terms of how we approach it, we don't use different techniques based on the sex of the person in front of us. Everyone starts with simple, gentle, static stretching exercises for all parts of the body. Then we add techniques such as the contract relax technique. We have a big focus on breathing, but the the key focus is on the feeling, the sensation. So this goes back to my comment about we're teaching an approach. So we've developed actually a little bit of a mantra that we give our students and we emphasize this in our teacher training program. So here's the mantra, move slowly with full awareness in your body, asking yourself the following questions. Where do I feel it? How does it feel? And can I relax more? That's the approach. So let's unpack that. Moving slowly Yes, it's for a safety consideration because we all know that dynamic stretching, if you're not used to it, can be potentially injurious if you're not used to controlling the end range of movement. So move slowly. But the safety aspect is a is a secondary thing for us, in fact. It is so you can maximise the sensation, maximise the feeling because that's what it's all about. And most people, when they come to stretching, particularly if they come with a history of some injuries, they are doing whatever they can to not feel. So move slowly is to maximise the sensation. And the second part was with full awareness in your body because only you can feel what you're feeling. The best teacher in the world can't feel what's going on in your body. They can have the best theoretical understanding of anatomy and everything to do potentially with flexibility, but they can't feel what's happening in your body. That is your job as a student. And talking about children and adults, adults do have the capacity to do that if they're directed. Put your awareness in your own body, whereas children, it's a slightly different interaction going on there, I would say. Um, And so then the questions were, where do you feel it? Because just because your teacher has said this is a hamstring stretch, for example, doesn't mean that's where you're feeling it. Where do you actually feel it? Because that then tells you, is this the correct position for me to target the part that I'm trying to get to? Maybe not. It needs to be modified. Um, And going just as a side note back to your comment, Jeffrey, about going to yoga classes, I went to a bunch of yoga classes when I was traveling in North America, and it was exactly as you described. It's a group of people in a room following someone up the front There's no interaction. There's no feedback between the teacher and student. It's just this is what we're doing and this is how we're doing. Now, this is ancient. This is not how it's taught on a lot of yoga studios these days. But that's not cultivating that internal awareness of how does it feel for me? What does my body need? Um, So where do I feel it? How does it feel is the next question. Because for the beginning stretcher, person first getting into stretching exercises, they will interpret any sensation as bad through to pain. And so unpacking or having a new experience of this is just a sensation and because I'm moving slowly with full awareness, if it is moving into pain, I know what to do. I back it off a little bit. I come out of it. I reapproach it. I do a different exercise. Um, But how does it feel? Really becoming aware of how does it feel? And then the third part was, can I relax more? Because for most adults, they haven't had an experience of what being physically relaxed actually feels like. It's an idea. And for a lot of athletes in particular, when they're doing flexibility work, 
they're not approaching it from a perspective of how does it feel and is it good or bad. They want the end result, which is improved range of movement for their activity or just because it's more spectacular, it's more sexy to be able to demonstrate these positions. But you'd be much better off approaching it in the way that I've just described, really learning how your body functions and doesn't function, redressing the restrictions, redressing the strength deficits, and then pursue the, the end range positions if, if you want to. I personally am no longer interested in that stuff. I can do the splits and all the rest of it, but so what? That didn't help me in becoming a more relaxed person. It just allowed me to do spectacular things. You're much better off doing, we're going back to that beginner idea, do the foundational work, do the beginner stuff, mm-hmm. particularly as an adult. Um, so, Jeffrey, you also mentioned CrossFit. Nothing against CrossFit. I think it's a great activity, but many, many adults started that activity wanting to do the more advanced stuff and just hurt themselves. And that was inevitable because they didn't have this intimate connection with their body. They didn't acknowledge that I don't have the range of movement to do that activity. I don't have the strength to do that activity. I don't, um, I'm only going to hurt myself doing this activity. So that's, that's, I think it's actually a bit of a stupid approach. Why would you pursue an activity just to do something sexy when you're going to hurt yourself, inevitably hurt yourself? So stretch therapy has been really useful for people across the spectrum, just the average person that wants to do some flexibility work and feel more comfortable, but also for a lot of those people that went to activities like CrossFit and recognising themselves, I am not. I haven't done the foundational work. I really can't keep pursuing that activity. I want to learn the ways to make myself more robust so that I can pursue the CrossFit stuff or the handstand training or whatever it is. Um, Stretch therapy can really help you in that Mm -hmm. endeavour. It really can help you because that's what we've been doing for 30 plus years, a very Mm -hmm. long time. Yeah. And also going, going back to the classes we used to run in Canberra, We didn't only run flexibility classes. We had a two-room facility. On one side, we did the flexibility work. On the other side, we did strength training. We would always recommend that people did the stretching classes first, even if you came in with a full-on athletic background, for all the reasons I've described. It's much more important to start with learning how to relax, redressing any range of movement restrictions, and then you'll have a much better experience and a much faster progression when you get into the strength training. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's, a, not that's not news to you, guys, but people don't want to do that. They want to jump into the exciting stuff. Yeah. Well, good luck yeah, with that. Everything, <laughs> <laughs> everything you're saying, like, is, it resonates with everything that we say on the back end as well, too. And yeah. like a couple of things you're highlighting here, and I'd like to go back to as well, but is the need for coaching in flexibility. I mean, we talk about this a lot is that no one knows how to create a user experience for it, but they will follow their friend to the gym and and load a barbell on their back with as much weight as possible Mm. because they were told that that's what they should do Mm -hmm. without, without even thinking about it. Right. But then it's just that, you know, coaching aspect like really highlighting the need for someone to be qualified to actually walk you through the process of Mm -hmm. where do you feel it how does it feel can you relax because no one knows that that's actually what they're trying to experience when they stretch like you said it's like they're just looking for that end result so that they can go do the maximal weight on their back again and hopefully Mm -hmm. it'll feel better right like um but yeah that's i think really highlighting the need for for someone to know how to walk you through that there's real um lacking of that i think like people going to yoga classes and you know the yoga there are better types of yoga that are available if you find it in the right spot and search for it but like the you know modern day person will just walk into whatever the cheapest one is they can find there's a lot of free ones around too that Mm. you know you just walk in and that's how they're going to handle it and there's no direction there's no no one to actually guide you through what it is you're experiencing well, two, two comments in response to that come to mind. The first is that 
when we, I keep harking back to that place we had in Canberra, we had a team of teachers there, but all of them had been long-time students of the system. And then one day, for whatever reason, they decided in themselves, I'd like to become a teacher in the system. And then the way we trained new teachers in that environment was on-the-job training, mentorship. They would be an assistant teacher in the beginner classes for some period of time. Some people spent three or four years training to become a teacher. Other people, it was six months. It was, it was very individual. But my point here is that they had had long time experience in their own body of how the system worked, how it worked for them. They'd been involved in multiple classes, seen, seen the effect of the approach on hundreds and hundreds of other students that they were in classes with. And then they went back and started again and reapproached all that information from the perspective of how do I teach it, which is a completely different thing to doing it. Um, and in my opinion, that is the best way to become a teacher of anything. First of all, you've been a student of it and you realise that you love it and then you want to learn how to share it with other people. So that's one comment. The second comment I'd make is, and this is in relation to our experience with our own stretch therapy teacher training program, which we've been running for many years in various formats. And one of the things I notice, the people that come, this is the generalisation, many people that come to do our teacher training, they are teachers or practitioners of some other related field. So we get yoga teachers, we get massage therapists, um, a lot of Pilates people come to learn our system. And one of the mental approaches that a lot of these people have, and I don't know if it's them as individuals or it's the training that they've had to become practitioners of those other systems is, I call it the, the what about questions. And this is what I mean. You, you're doing a simple exercise. We've already gone through in detail the approach that I just articulated, but the mind throws up all of these what about this question. So here's an example. We're doing gentle, supported spinal extension. And then without even getting down and trying it, the person will say, well, what about the person that's got this? What about the client that might have this history? What about some obscure spinal condition? And that, that is the way they're approaching it. The what about the thing that's going to prevent the person doing the exercise or potentially hurt themselves. And so my, the, the imp in my brain goes, well, have you ever experienced a student like that? No. So what are you worried about? Why? But I'm, I'm saying that, that there's this caution about even doing the exercises and that, that energy will translate into how you teach. Mm -hmm. So, I'm not articulating that very well, but, but that is what we see again and again and again. People will come and they'll say, I really want to learn this system. I think it's great. I've done a little bit of practice. But they're worried about all the things that might go wrong. Now, in my experience teaching this stuff for over 25 years, nothing's ever gone wrong. It just doesn't happen because you understand the way to teach it, you understand the mechanics of the exercise, and you are giving really clear instruction to your students about what to do. And also part of that approach of move slowly with full awareness in the body, in your body, that is putting the onus back on the individual to work out what to do. Because so much, in my opinion, of treatments that people get or classes they go to, it's your attention is 100% outside of yourself. You're focused on the teacher telling you what to do or you're just a passive recipient of some treatment. Stretch therapy is not like that. It's all about you doing the work and feeling what it feels like. And if it doesn't feel good, having the teacher modify it for you, change it for you, know how to make it right for you right then and there. But it's a two-way thing. It's not a one-way approach. And as a teacher, I never go into a class with the idea of, oh, my God, this is going to go wrong, this is going to go bad, nothing negative like that. And it, it, if you go in with that approach, that's what happens. 
it's it's mm. it's a good approach. It's altogether a good approach. Um, I'll tell you a funny anecdote. We went to a one-day workshop with Ryan Hurst from GMB here in Adelaide, and it was all about his um, animal movements and that stuff. It was great. And it was, it was Kit and I were there and a whole bunch of other people in the related field, and Ryan did a little Q&A at the end of it, and one of the guys piped up, and he was, I think, a, a movement-type guy, and he had all these students, and his question to Ryan was, well, how am I going to introduce this to my clients? He was terrified about going back with this new information and getting his students to try it. And, I mean, I just looked, what what kind of question is that? And that was the look on Ryan's face and Kit and I. But it's it's all about building a relationship between you and your students. I, In all yeah. the years I taught, I could have got my students doing whatever I wanted because that trust had been built up. Yeah, so th- th- that was such a funny experience. I couldn't understand that you would go and do a training and then you'd be worried about how you would take this back to your students. Mm-hmm. Don't you find that yeah. fascinating? I was, I was gobsmacked. No, I, I yeah. mean, yeah, that's a huge limiter for a lot of people is knowing how to steer questions or I like to say counsel because there's a counseling aspect mm-hmm. to coaching where, I mean, you can know everything, but your yep. people skills... Mm-hmm. Knowing how to read the person and how to make them comfortable is always number one. Like, yes. And I'll get that question sometimes with real movement. We run some mentorship for coaches and they come in and they, they want us to share our experiences. And mm-hmm. that question like comes up a lot. They'll be very, okay, well, if I, so I get someone to hold the stretch for this long and, you know, and then I do this, I'm like, we'll just get them to hold it for the first time or a couple of times, however comfortable they're feeling in that like mm-hmm. holding it like make them comfortable first counsel them through it mm-hmm. and that's really the missing kind of piece to well probably most coaching elements but really in flexibility you can't there's no way about knowing how to like counsel someone through it and you know mm-hmm. even push them to an, another level with it as well mm-hmm. um so yeah that is interesting that's mm-hmm. a that's a big skill knowing how to steer those questions that most of the yeah. questions they're asking aren't going to come up anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, one other comment I might I'll make. I I personally don't like working one to one. I I am a qualified personal trainer, but I don't ever work one to one. There is something about being in a group setting where so many excellent things happening. Um, because because there's a whole lot of psychology with working with someone. You know, they they want to look flexible or they they don't want to do the work or, you know, they're, let's say they're a, a person that tends to always go very gently. Somehow as a teacher, you need to encourage them to work a little bit more intensely from time to time because we know mm-hmm. that the more novel the stimulus on that person's system, the more likely they'll have to have some result from it. Um, but similarly, the other end of the spectrum, there's lots of people that go gung-ho all the time. You want to encourage them to pull back and, you know, work differently. Um I find that in the group environment, so many good things happen. The people that just want to dominate and make it all about me, you can shut them down very nicely and you can bring them back to just do the work because that's what we're here to do. Um, the people that are very reticent, you can can bring them along because they see that it's a very comfortable environment, it's a very welcoming environment. But that there's so much good about training in a group um, that I think doesn't happen so much one-to-one so Mm -hmm. i i would encourage the listeners out there to get part of a group rather than a one-to-one nothing against personal training (laughs) not putting that down as something you can do it's great Mm -hmm. but you use the word counseling in my experience one-to-one it becomes very often a bit of a a talk fest i want to just listen to me a bit of a counseling session um Talking about stuff is great. We love words. I mean, you interviewed Kit. He could talk underwater. But <laughs> it, it's, the, it's the doing the activity that's key, doing it, not talking yeah. about it, not thinking about it, doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And that comes back to that those things about, you know, how long should I hold it? What's the intensity or the rest of it? Leave all of those details aside. Just get down and do some stuff. And yeah. then your body will tell you, do I want to go more intensely can Mm -hmm. I go more intensely should I hold it longer you have to learn that in your own body and you can only learn it by doing it 
it sounds obvious, but for a lot of people it's not obvious. They just want to be told, do it like this and you'll have this result. Well, maybe you will. Maybe you won't. I mean, you could you could say that about even you know, like other aspects of fitness too. Even sometimes it's like learning to strength train. It's like, well, part of it is just picking it up, <laughs> you know, and just like the vast majority of it is picking it up. <laughs> yeah, like it's part of it's like you, you got to experience it a little bit. Obviously, there's some you know smart approaches to not going too heavy or yeah. Even people overthinking walking sometimes, like how long should I walk? At what speed should I walk? Just go for a walk. Just relax. Yeah. <laughs> just, right. You know, like take in your experience and your environment for a change. But yeah, that's no, that's uh, I think a great topic as well to kind of mm. um, go into. But yeah, we, we did. Uh, Do you have anything to add there? That me or that was that to Jeff? I guess you. I, just, I heard you say something. I thought you were. <laughs> no? no okay um <A> gremlin <laughs> so when you when you um started talking about the stretch therapy approach 18 plus you know mm. the key focuses on feeling um one of the things you also did say is you said there's no difference in gender approach mm. so we jeff and i get this a lot and um a lot of people like we, we did that live the other day as well and someone said well men are more flexible women or no men are are naturally tight and women are more flexible. You know, we, we could, Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really nice to have you on and to say like, okay, in your experiences, now you're, you're on the other end of, you know, the spectrum, you're a woman, what in your experiences of coaching people and your own body and in your own teachings, is there a difference? Like, have you ever come across there being, Mm. you know, yeah, yes. As a general generalization, yes. You would say mm-hmm. women tend to be a bit more flexible than men. Mm-hmm. And men definitely have the capacity to get stronger, you know, hormonal reasons, those sorts of things. But this is what we've found over all the years we've been teaching adults. And this is across the age range and it applies to men and women, across the adult age range, because that's who we work with. The the average starting capacity of the individuals over that 30-year period has got poorer and poorer and poorer. So what I mean is the exercises that we used to teach as our beginner, gentle, starting exercises, we don't use them anymore because they're too advanced for the average adult Western body that comes to a class. People are stiffer, they have less connection to their body, less awareness. Um, They need easier and easier exercises to get started. That is what we've found, and it's true of men and women. Mm -hmm. That's really, that's our experience, not so much the women are are more flexible than men and so going back to that whole idea of a beginner we we don't use different techniques in those early experiences of being part of a stretch therapy class we all just go through the same exercises with all the different modifications that we have all the different variations Um, I would say that we use variations on exercises depending on the individual and that that it's not that we use particular variations because of that person's a man versus a woman it's we're we're exploring a particular range of movement we see what the individuals in front of us can and can't do we modified it based on that Um, but then of course as as the students become more experienced in their own body then we introduce a whole range of different techniques and it one of which is the contract relax and absolutely we find that Men seem to benefit from doing longer, more intense contractions in order to help them really get more flexible, whereas women tend to be able to do what I describe as more passive exercises where they're literally just hanging out in a position. But that's just a broad-scale observation that we've had. But I would argue that 
if if for example you get flexible from just doing passive long held positions do you really want that because you want the strength to support mm-hmm. that new range of movement so i would recommend you do some of the stronger stuff anyway to make sure that you're getting the strength and that's what i've been working on in my own body especially for the last 10 years making sure that i maintain the strength as i get older that's actually more important i think than getting more flexible mm-hmm. yeah so that's a very long answer to your question the the initial approach is no different depending on whether the person is a male or a female coming to our classes but because we have so many different techniques and protocols that we can employ in stretch therapy it's up to me in this case as the instructor to suggest one that i think might work for that individual it really is a very individualized approach within a group setting mm-hmm. yeah and the more people that you work with the more ways you figure out what approaches work best for those individuals exactly yeah and that takes a lot of time which is why i go back to um the way we used to train teachers in canberra was they had already had all of those experiences in their own body they had some experience to draw on and then when they started teaching they had that experience to draw on and then you know you might introduce those exercises techniques to a student and it doesn't work so you have to have some other technique that you can give those people yeah. Mm-hmm. So it, it's very fluid. There's nothing dogmatic in the stretch therapy system. If you showed me something better than what I've been doing for the last 30 years right now, I'd say, fantastic. That's what we're going to use now. It's just about the best possible information. And, yeah. and going back to being a teacher, that is all you can expect from a teacher, them giving you the best possible information they have at that moment in time. And it will, might change tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then and th- I guess in, in thinking about those individual approaches, what would be like the most common thing that you would see um, in an adult coming? I guess, it, would there be a difference male to female and like what the most common imbalances or weaknesses are? Um, do you see like trends that way at all? Or is it usually similar? Is there like a common trend that you see? No, I, no, no particular trend. Everyone is tight in the hips, mm-hmm. especially the hip flexors. Everyone's tight through that range of movement, and that's one of the ones that we focus on a lot. Um, maybe 20 years ago I would say that women tended to be looser in the shoulders and the spine, but you just find the trend is people are tighter and tighter and less body aware than they were. Even 10 years ago we've noticed that. Yeah, and it much younger. So, you know, we were based at university, so the typical student would be 18 plus, and then we had students right through to, you know, 70s and 80s. Even the younger people coming to the beginner classes, so the 18-year-olds, they were stiffer than the 18-year-olds that we had 10 years before that. People are just stiffer and stiffer and weaker as well, not just yeah. less flexible, weaker. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I agree 100%. I mean, that's just the the fact of the matter is there's the general population, but even whether it be athletic or not, it doesn't even for what I've experienced the past, basically, seven or eight years of training people is that Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. (laughs) Like you said, each individual has their own area that that they, they, they can experience this in like, yeah, you might be good here because it's all you ever do. But then if you put your hip this way or this way, or like it changes the whole thing. Right. Um, yeah. And I talked about this with Kit and, and I talked about this with Lucas a lot is I had kind of a, an epiphany as a trainer um, after it took a little while um, because at first you almost don't want to believe it, but I also worked in um, the, the physical therapy setting for a while, not as a, not as a therapist, but I did the exercises for the the patients and stuff. Yeah. And, um, that was really like kind of my first realm that I was in. So everything obviously revolved around people experiencing pain, um, in, in real, you know, acute obviously, but just, you know, chronic, uh, pain as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when I kind of went out of that setting and started just doing more personal training, even working with athletes, 
the epiphany I had was exactly what you said when you started this podcast, and that's most any movement in the that humans experience in their body at any given time is is experienced as pain. And I mean, and that was my it, it just hit me one day, and I don't even remember. I think I just got so sick of how does that feel, and people going, "Well, it hurts. It's painful. It hurts." And I'm like, what do you mean it hurts? It's painful. And then you start to break down, and then they start to think about it, and then the ch- the experience starts to change a little bit, like. Does it hurt like someone just came up with you to hit you with a baseball bat hurt? Or does it just like, is it just uncomfortable or you're not used to it? And then they start to go, oh yeah, like, it, I guess it doesn't, it's not painful. It's just I'm not used to it. Or, you know, you start to, it's, it's really interesting how almost the instant association of anything is pain. It's stretching, yeah. obviously, like a, when you get too close to your end range. That's for all of us. That's the, the you know, the reaction we kind of have is, oh, pain, but mm-hmm. I'm talking, you know, like you said, just they can't, they walk around day to day. That's pain. Like it's, it's the very, very basics before you even get into these, the aspects of strength training and and stretching. It's just, everything is pain to them. And it's, um, it's quite an interesting phenomenon. I mean, obviously we were not designed to just as human beings, we would not be here if, if our whole track of existence was just we experience pain all the time right like that's not Mm -hmm. how we should be living our lives um yeah absolutely and that was the transition for flexibility for me was i was trying to address pain hip pain shoulder pain um and and i did address those things and then i transitioned into more of the sexy stuff obviously like i did not get into flexibility because i saw somebody do this place and thought it was cool i was obviously one of those people that's like that's never going to happen for me i think that's impossible Mm -hmm. um it was to address pain. And then through that experience, I realized after breaking several barriers, not only mentally and physically, like, Oh man, I can do flexibility gave me the, Oh man, I can do anything with my body experience that mm-hmm. I want to do. And that I put the time in to do, um, mm-hmm. and then got into the sexy work. And then after having a couple boys, it's transitioned from, I love to do the sexy work and I'm able to do it but my experience day to day of being able to live life that I know the large majority of other parents and I'm sure Lucas has the same experience. They can't experience that. I can go anywhere at any time and do anything with my kids. I can full on participate. Yeah. I have no considerations on it. And that's like what flexibility strength, obviously, but, mm-hmm. but flexibility for me and even the way Lucas and I approach it have given us the opportunity to build more strength. So, yes, you know, it's that cycle of, flexibility, strength, flexibility, strength, and you just keep, you know, generating the capacity of that to go larger and broader and larger and broader, you know, to, to whatever end result you wish to take it. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's just that initial, everything's pain. It's, it's a really, if you don't experience that day to day, which, you know, fortunately I've never really experienced that. It is kind of hard to understand at first. Like, yeah, I know that I know like a lot of people actually experience that. Yeah. So, yeah, it seems like those with an athletic background tend to handle what m- most would call pain quite well because it's, you know, it's just yeah. stiffness and, you know, sore muscles and stuff like that. Like you're, if you have an athletic background, you're, you're maybe more susceptible to it. And you're like, no, this feels fine. Like I can feel stiffness and numbness, but I know it'll go away if I work on it. Like, so it's, it is a bit of a challenge that way too. Yes. But um, yeah, that, that's, that's an interesting segue to, Jeff talking about the sexy stuff Mm -hmm. I would be interested to know like do you guys encourage um your students or coaches to go to that level or is it more of like if you want to more if you want to Mm -hmm. um so I mean Kit's pretty obsessed with side splits that's something he really wants to do better um I, I I I mean, I, I can do those movements, so they're not really that interesting to me. I'm, I'm much more interested in the strength side of things. Yeah. Um, I think that's actually more important as you get older is to maintain your strength. Um, yeah, if, if you want to be able to do a particular range of movement just because you want to be able to do that position, that's great. And it's, it's a nice um, a way to mark your progression. I'm here now, this is my range of movement, and I can see using these techniques over time, I'm, I'm getting better at that range of movement. Um, some people need a particular 
increase in range of movement, say in legs apart or whatever it is, because they want to be able to do some other skill. Like it's very important for a lot of the handstand work if you want to pursue that. Um, I am much more interested in what Jeffrey mentioned, which is I want to just be able to do whatever I want with my body. If I want to go bushwalking for three days and carry a heavy pack, I want my body to be strong enough, mobile enough, comfortable enough to be able to do that stuff. Or, you know, get the kayak out and go kayaking in the river. I just want to be able to do what I want with my body. That's what I want. All the sexy stuff. It's just sexy. It's not that interesting to me personally. But I, I can teach other people how to develop those skills if they want to. Yeah. Actually, it's go, almost like, go ahead. I was going to say, going back to that, that question about do you notice any difference between men and women, I would say um, generally speaking women need to focus a little bit more on the, the strength side than mm -hmm. the flexibility side. Just generally speaking, I would say that. Yeah. Yeah, Jeff, you've worked with like a lot of uh, individuals that came to you specifically for strength. Like you've had a lot of dancers and reach out knowing that you you do flexibility, but they see you doing the strength work and they're thinking, okay, I'm really flexible, but I'm, I'm damaged. Yeah. So what's damaged, going on? Damaged or, um, you know, maybe even this is something Olivia can talk about is this fallacy that you can only be one or the other, mm -hmm. which exists heavily amongst Power athletes, you know, powerlifters in this. And I, and I can understand because, look, you only need so much range of motion to perform mm -hmm. a lot of those movements. The issue mm -hmm. that we run into a lot is that powerlifting and bodybuilding is used as the predominant technique of training these highly dynamic and variable team sport athletes. So you take athletes that, you know, even on a football field with almost – an infinite amount of variability within just one single game and but you refine their training to such a limited restricted range of motion only for the sake of just power power strength 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 and look i'm, I'm one of those people that look I, strength is king like it, it rules all i mean it definitely does without a doubt mm -hmm. um but to the point where i what i deal with is non-contact injuries are through the roof guys popping hamstrings and Achilles and shredding the ACL and MCL and mm. you know, patellar tendonitis and, and plantar fasciitis and just all these crazy things that, you know, it, it's, it, it's crazy to think that that's, but, but, you know, my shoulders hurt in a bench press. Well, if they hurt, let's put a board between the chest now and the bar and, and you know, well, my shoulders hurt when I dip, well, just don't go down all the way. And there is a lot of this, will back off of the range of motion to, yeah. to that's kind of the solution in Western strength training is, mm -hmm. is that a don't do that solution or B let's restrict the movement as much as possible. So we can still mm -hmm. achieve some obs obscure level of strength almost um, in the bench press or whatever, because we think mm -hmm. that that's going to be better for you as a, as a team athlete. But my experience mm -hmm. and a lot of the success that we've had with ATG is, is we are one of the, few you know as outside of rain, real movement who really deals with professional football players basketball players and these guys and we incorporate heavy stretching and it's we are I'm, i mean we're under fire for it all the time because mm. in the west again there's this idea that stretching is bad or, or the literature says that you know because we have everyone science-based now you know you you can't be an experienced coach with decades of training and and, and have tons of these results and that who cares about mm. that right it's just about what they say in the literature or whatever yeah but but we have this we have this problem at least that's what we experience again i don't know if you experience that but mm -hmm. we experience this kind of like well, well the science says this but but it goes back to exactly what you said is you have a strength coach telling an athlete not to stretch who's never stretched his entire life how are you going to tell somebody that they shouldn't do something that you've never never experienced this thing mm -hmm. but but these kids take this advice yeah and I'm getting 12, 13, 14, 15, like you said, young who are experiencing all these issues and the first, oh, well, we're going to stretch. And they're just kind of like, I was told that's such a bad thing. You shouldn't yeah. do that. You shouldn't stretch. Um, you know, do you, do you ever deal with this, this, um, this kind of thing that I don't even know if Lucas deals with it as much as I do, but mm -hmm. I, I mean, I know he hears it, but do you deal with this, this, this whole 
kind of fight that's between like these science-based strength coaches and in the guys out here teaching flexibility and, and, you know, and, and where the base of this even comes from, because everything mm -hmm. that I've seen in the literature and then experienced with my athletes is for what it's worth, the literature for the most part is very much on the side of improving range of motion through flexibility. Mm -hmm. Of course, the context and how you do that and those techniques are important. Like you said, it's not worth anybody's time to just be passively flexible. Like just in that one, you know, mm -hmm. way to be flexible because obviously there are different variations. You know, there's dynamic flexibility and there's static flexibility and there's these different displays of yeah. it. But but I see that like that's what a lot of the literature is. It's it's predominantly based purely around just static stretching. Mm -hmm. You know, and then they do the crazy things like, let me just static stretch my hamstrings for an hour and then go sprint. And then it makes you slower. So stretching is bad for you. I mean, how do, how, how, have we come to, how have we come to this point where stretching is almost not cool to do when you're pursuing strength sports or team sports or these things? I mean, these, because tons of athletes, thousands we do. I mean, we have almost 4,500 athletes in our system mm -hmm. and almost every single one of them has come to us with this conundrum of sorts that they've always been told it's bad for them. I mean, it's, to mm -hmm. me, it's an alarming, I mean, it's only 4,500 people, but it's, it's, I'm starting to realize it is this consensus that exists in Western strength and conditioning that, that, mm -hmm. that flexibility is such a bad thing. Um, you know, so maybe you have some, some insight into that, mm -hmm. why that exists, or, or maybe some arguments against why that exists, or maybe even in support of it. I'd be here, you know, I'd be interested to hear if you have that too. So. Well, we, when I say we, I would say Kit and I, what we're involved with, we just don't engage with any of that. We just don't engage with it. First of all, athletes are not really our audience. We, we teach what we have found over many years of direct experience with bodies. We teach what we found works. And like I described before, we notice that people are very restricted in their range of movement and we fundamentally believe that getting people less restricted is the starting point. But the, the, the in, removing the restrictions comes from the experience of being able to relax and, you know, experiencing those movements as comfortable, not pain, like um, Jeffrey was describing before. Having a different experience of doing those activities, that's what it's actually about. That's the starting point. Yes, over time you'll get... Um, increased range of movement potentially um, and then we would always move on to the strength side because that's extremely important to be strong um, but but the end goal or the having to be able to do a particular activity is not the people we work with you're talking about athletes who need to keep going they need to get back on the field um, so it, it, it's a different mindset I would say and you know if you talk about professional sports the job of all the trainers is to get the person back on the field. They're not really that interested or the, whatever it is. They're not that interested in the longer term outcomes for that individual's body. It's just, they use the techniques that they will, they find get that person back competing. Um, I mean, you know, we could go onto the whole thing of sport is a, a big money-making thing. So there's money behind all of this stuff as well. That, that's the focus is on getting people going. Now, going back to the, the idea of, you know, should you even use flexibility work? It's not just flexibility work that people need, in my opinion. It's conditioning work. And if you think about the gymnasts who all start as a child, if you start gymnastics as a five-year-old or six-year-old and you, you go through, say, the 10 years that I did, you have done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of conditioning. And that conditioning is mainly for the joints of the body. The problem with a lot of athletes these days is they get specialized very early into maybe a sport like that has dynamic aspects to it or and they don't do the conditioning work that conditions them for the competition that they're doing. Any gymnast has all of that conditioning in their body. And I came to stretch therapy as 21 year old with all of that conditioning in my body. So it's a completely different pathway that the, the individual has gone through 
um, in their early life. The, the problem with a lot of people doing CrossFit and those sorts of things is they jump up on the rings and they try and do all these activities and they might be muscularly strong and they might have semi-decent range of movement, but their joints are not conditioned for those activities. We found that in our own monkey gym in Canberra, when we got back into the, the men's gymnastics strength training, which was largely off the back of um, our connection with Coach Sommer for that brief period of time, we started having elbow problems and all that kind of stuff because we weren't conditioned for climbing the ropes and that kind of thing. So it's it's actually about being a little bit humble and a bit honest with yourself about my body needs this foundational stuff before I can hope, hope to do that other stuff and not hurt myself. And the most interesting thing you said a minute ago, Jeffrey, was that you're seeing non-contact trauma injuries in these athletes. That's that means that body is not conditioned for the demands of that sport. Yeah, it's it's exponential. I mean, it's something we deal with. I mean, you know, and the, and the frustrating thing, and of course you you said, right, I mean, I didn't know that the conversation would take this direction, but money behind it, of course, billions of dollars of these teams. I mean, it's, this guy's done, find the next one, right? There's very little reason for them to want to invest in these athletes. And essentially that's what we've done. I mean, we've brought, NFL players back from Achilles tears who ended up playing nine years in the league. We've had basketball players that were told they were done because they have knee tendonitis that end up going and playing at the very minimal level pro ball overseas. Um, yeah. And flexibility has been a big piece of that. I mean, without a doubt, our system is, it is the flexibility and what, but even the movements that we use and the ranges of movements we use, you know, how we use a, a, a split squat compared to traditionally how people use the Bulgarians. I mean, there's, we've really taken strength training from a lot of this mid range, mid range, mid range, and let's train this end concentric range. Let's, let's train this end eccentric range because you, like you said, everyone's already really good right here in the middle, right? Everyone's really good. Everyone's good. You guys come in. Wow. You have great deadlift. You're a great squat. You're a great bench press. You can't press overhead. You, you, your ankles are weak, your calf, you can't do calf raises with your body weight. You can't, you know, you can't raise your toes to your shins. You can't do rotator cuff work. So that's the bulk of our system is all this tertiary work that most trainers are going to go, well, if we have time for the rotator cuff after the bench press, we'll do it. But if not, who cares? Right. But we've flipped that around. Like you, you're, our focus is going to be you're doing rotator cuff work for, you know, however much, and then you're doing the stretching and opening up. But, you know, even we get a lot of, of players who, who go off to college, who go off to university, who, who come from high school. If, if they survive high school lifting, <laughs> they go to college and they lift and they come yeah. back to us during the summer and they're like, man, my sh and it's not from their sport. That's like the, the thing I, it's, they're not beat up from their sport. They're beat up from the bad training they get. And then of course they have the volume of their sport on top of that, but yeah. they go to the collegiate level or even the pro level. And just because you're a pro trainer, it doesn't mean you have any business putting your hands on any athletes because the training methodology is just very poor. In, in yeah. my opinion, that's just my experience because we deal with these guys all the time Yeah. Um, who come to us. What do I do? I, I need to have hip surgery. I need to have knee surgery. Or this is what I've been told. And, and the first step, the biggest thing for me is I also made that transition with flexibility is let's use flexibility to assess how you feel in your body and what you think you need to handle. And that's when you start to see all these light bulbs go off in these guys' heads. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I have, I, I, I was told I need to go have hip surgery, but I have no internal hip rotation, zero. Mm -hmm. Well, predominantly almost any movement that you need to do as an athlete requires internal hip rotation. You know, no wonder you have back issues and hip issues and knee issues because yeah. Almost everything you have to do, you require that range of motion, but you don't have it. Yeah. Um, and there is a school of thought. And Lucas, we kind of laugh about this sometimes. Is a lot of strength coaches are, well, just throw some weight on it and, and just try to get into that range. Just it's like you know the, the old the old forcing it almost kind of method of like, hmm. you know, which is really fascinating to us, right? Like, well, yeah, they're just, recommending that because that's all they know. They don't have hmm. any other techniques. No. Um, I'm gonna make two comments. One is that. You don't need to do a huge amount of what I would describe as the remedial stuff or the countering for what you just described, Jeffrey. So if you have a, a person and they just don't have that range of movement, you don't need to do a lot of work to, to even things out enough so that their system as a whole is more robust. 
It's, it's not like you have to stop all the other training you're doing or stop competing. Right. You only need a little bit of the other side of it to help that body become more robust. That's what mm -hmm. we find. Um, yeah, the, the, the second comment's gone out of my head, but that, that, that's a thing. Um, oh, that, that, this is the second comment. We, um, we also do a lot of strength training. We have a, a sub-brand called Monkey Gym, and we used to run workshops on that. And the question I'd always get at the end of the two- or three-day workshop is, well, how am I going to program the flexibility stuff in with my strength training? People are fixated on this idea of how am I going to program it? And I say to them, well, you're not. And they're like, what, what do you mean? I have to program it. No. So I say to them, how many training sessions do you do in your weekly program? And they go, six. And I say, right, one of those, you're going to dedicate it just to stretching. Rather than do six strength training sessions a week, you're just going to take one of those sessions and you're just going to practice some of the stretching that you've learned in this course. So completely divorce it from all this other work that they're doing and just experience the stretching and then gauge does that change the way I feel in my body? Does it translate into any benefit to me in the activity that I'm doing, whether that be lifting or a team sport or whatever it is? Treat it as a separate experience. That's my strong recommendation to anyone that's never done any stretching work and is noticing that there's limitations in their body or they're getting injured Work with someone like you guys or, you know, find someone that knows something about flexibility training and just dedicate one of your training sessions a week to that and see what happens. Mm -hmm. I'll give you another anecdote just for the, the general person not doing any particular um, sport. All the time we taught those classes in Canberra, people, the vast majority of people would come to one 75-minute class a week and even though we gave them recommendations on here's some exercises we'd suggest you do as a daily practice, we knew that for 99.9% .9 of them, they didn't do any other flexibility training in their weekly program. And yet over the course of a 14-week program, because we ran 14-week semesters in line with the university semester, by about week six or seven, the people would say, look, I'm really noticing that that thing I used to do is freed up now. It feels completely different. So my big point here is that you don't have to do a lot of this stuff in order to get some real changes in your body. It's a very yeah, small amount of stuff. And I would say it's true of the remedial strength stuff too. If you have the right intervention, the body will respond very quickly. But if you keep beating your body up and not using this remedial stuff, it will break. And that's what you guys are seeing. Yeah. And I think that's like a lot of Lucas and I's success is a lot of people do see us. And these guys, like I recently, before this kind of virus thing, did a, actually right when it started, did a, a squatting holiday where I squatted three times a day. And of course, all the comments were just like, oh my God, how do you squat three times a day? How does you, how have your hips not been destroyed? How have your back not been destroyed? How is your shoulders? And I'm like, man, I feel great. Like I could squat. I can squat three times. Like I don't have any problem with that. Um, yeah. But you we mean like, do you mean like a lifting squat, a squatting session. Yeah. Like a barbell back squat okay. yep. three day, three times a day. It was just like a, you know, just a, let's see where we can take my squat in a week kind of thing. Um, okay. You know, one of those things that I wouldn't recommend for everyone, obviously, but, um, but it, it's an application commonly used, you know, in power sports and stuff, obviously like, mm. You have so much time. Let's get as much volume in as we can and, and to make this improvement as fast as we can. And, and I just experimented with it, but I felt great. But Lucas and I lift hard and lift heavy all the time. And that's a lot of the comments that we get is, man, you guys just like lift however you want, as hard as you want, whenever you want. I mean, and, but it doesn't affect us. And I think that's like really one of the things that Lucas and I, you're right with the remedial training. You spend a little bit of time on that remedial, maybe. Yeah, rotator cuff, you probably, if you train it right, only need about six weeks of it, you can go right back going to whatever you want to do in very, you know, maybe once a year, you know, this is general, of course, but come back and revisit it and see how it's doing. And 
check that, yep. check up on it. And if it's good, keep going. And that's kind of the experience is mm. uh, do some grip work for six weeks or, you know, and, mm-hmm. and chances are like, it's just gonna, it was, it's just so far gone from what they've done that just that tiny little bit of investment for, like you said, maybe a, a mesocycle, a six to eight week block or something. And yeah. they never even have to look back at it. Right. Like that's it. Okay, yeah. cool. I, I'm good. Um, it- Except that I'll just make a, a slight counter comment there. One of the reasons for doing regular once a week or every now and then flexibility training is it is a way to feel whether any of the parts of your body need a bit of that remedial work. So you might do a series of shoulder stretches if we're talking about rotator cuff and you will feel that, well, that actually does feel a bit more restricted than it used to. So maybe I need to do a bit more flexibility work there and or some remedial activation work for that so flexibility work is is about feeling how your body feels and what does it need does it need a bit more stretching training does it need a bit more conditioning does it need a bit more actual strength work what does it need and it's very useful to go back regularly to even very basic beginner poses use that term again and find out how your body's traveling That's one really important use of flexibility. But you need to have that experience and that awareness in your body for that to be meaningful for you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it's interesting that you it's interesting you said six to seven weeks there because that was my experience. Was about what was it, Lucas? Would you say probably Lucas and I kind of started this journey together. So it's funny. We probably know everything about each other's training for the past seven or eight years. Like we've literally gone back and forth every day. I think it was about six to seven weeks. I kind of half, for lack of a better term, half assed my stretching for six Mm -hmm. weeks. And even still in that six weeks, I kind of had that moment where I was like, wow, this, this actually feels so much better um, than it did before. And that's, that's when I kind of got hooked when I had that little, like, Oh, wow. It really does work. Even if it was such like a tiny little nominal amount to anybody else, Mm -hmm. to me, it was a, like you said, almost a completely different experience. Normally I get into this position and it's bizarrely uncomfortable, but now it's, I have it and this feels great. Yeah. And and, and it built on that. But I just thought the time frame that you gave was kind of interesting because that kind of aligns with about the same time that I had that first experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it, it doesn't take long, you know, I mean, depending on who you ask, six weeks might be long to somebody, but for most people, six weeks is like, if yeah. I told you you're going to have some sort of positive experience from doing this in six weeks, mm-hmm. most people are going to go, okay, I can do that in six mm-hmm. weeks. And then, and then they're kind of, once they have the experience, the sales process is almost over. Right. And it's just like, okay, yeah. they bought it. so it's not just that it's not a long period of time. And that's just, you know, what we found, it could be 10 weeks. It might be 20 weeks. It doesn't matter. Um, it was more the very small amount of work that was being done by those people, mm. very small amount. And also something to keep in mind, it's obvious, but I don't think people do keep it in mind, is that any training you're doing is in the context of the rest of your life, um, which is actually why I recommend don't try and program. If you're new to stretching, don't try and program it with the other things. Just do it as a separate activity and feel how it feels. So when I say the rest of your life, I mean, you guys have got young children, you've got jobs, you've got all this other stuff that's going on. Um, That will affect how long it takes your system to change when you start your stretching work. Completely individual. Yeah, it's, yeah, I really like that idea of it being a separate experience. And And for those individuals that truly do finally buy into it or decide that they need to do it. It's like they make that decision. Like I need to experience this separately from everything else I've experienced. And it's when you start, you know, meeting uh, systems and finding systems like stretch therapy and, you know, seeing coaches like Emmett Lewis presenting things and you realize like, Oh, this is a totally different experience. It's like, (laughs) this is completely separate. People are doing this outside of the norm and, or what is mm-hmm. thought to be the norm. And then next thing you know, it's like, oh, wow. It's, mm. Yeah, that's, that's a very key word, experience, right? Like separate experience. It's hard for me to comment on that because this is my norm. This is what I do. This I've done yeah. all this time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it, it, you made a comment before, Jeffrey, about how people will do flexibility and they still experience 
a new range of movement as pain. My relationship to flexibility training is not like that. I I have days when I do a stretch that I've done before and I might be trying to go a little bit further and I experience it as a little bit more restricted than, say, when I did it the last time. But it's not pain. That that word just doesn't come into my mind. It's not pain. Um, Pain for me is, um, you know, someone whacks me in the head. That's pain. But stretching as an experience is not pain. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know if that helps anyone. But that, and also, when I teach, when we teach, we make a joke about this. We don't let people use the word pain. If they, if you say, "How does it feel?" and they go, "It's painful," you go, "Really? Do you want to try and think of another word?" Because even just the saying of the word pain is, it, it's. Yeah, I, I can't even describe this. But if you use yeah. a different word, if you come up with a little bit more subtle ways of explaining it to yourself that helps you realize that's not actually pain it's just a feeling it might be a strong feeling Um, and more particularly and much more importantly is if indeed it is pain or even too intense too strong what can I do to make it better more comfortable that's part of the learning process because if you don't learn how to change it for yourself you just won't do it because it's just your expectation will always be this will be pain and then you won't do flexibility. So we'll go back to that approach that I mentioned, moving slowly, full awareness, where do I feel it, how does it feel? I said, can you relax more? But another question you could be asking yourself is how can I change that sensation? What do I need to do in terms of repositioning or whatever it is to make it more comfortable? That, that's part of the exploration in flexibility work. I'd argue it's true for strength training as well, but with flexibility, people don't want to do that because their whole experience and their whole language is, I do this and it's pain. And the only option is to stop and not do it again because I don't want to experience yeah, that pain. Yeah. Well, then you're getting nowhere. I mean, semantics are pretty important, right? I mean, words, words have meaning to people. I mean, they absolutely do. I mean, you know, if, if I were to, you know, text my wife right now and and say, you know, I hate you, which I would never do, but that has a meaning. Like it means something the same way. Like I love you has a meaning, right? So pain has a very heavy meaning. That's like that, that, that of course, like if, as soon as somebody says that word, the picture that's going to come to their mind usually is not going to be stretching. It's going to be some crazy thing that they have experienced in their life as pain. And then all of a sudden there's this weird like mental association simply because they are approaching this level of discomfort that they, you know, yeah. it is, a, it, it's, a, it's a really fascinating topic in its own, just the way you think about things and the words you use to describe them and how they can. And I have experienced that in my in flexibility sessions before mm. where I approach a session and I'm like, Oh, this is going to be easy. And then boom, you know, mm-hmm. the, the range is easy to access. But then I've had reasons for whatever explanation given where, oh, man, I don't really feel confident about it today. And, of course, going into it, um, mm-hmm. it didn't feel that way. And it's an interesting story is I, I achieved head to toe through Emmett, which, of course, is one of those sexy things that, um, that you mm-hmm. talked about earlier. Um, yeah. For me, it was, it was very much the mental experience of, one, I, doing something that most people think is impossible. I mean, most people think that like, doing the splits is impossible, let alone touching your head to your toe. Mm-hmm. But was that, that switch of this is extremely un- uncomfortable to almost embracing the experience as a learning experience and as an exploration experience and not as a reactive sort of, and, and it's funny because we're doing this, dynamic kicking challenge right now and I wanted to test my head to toe and, and yes and I haven't I haven't stretched my head to toe and I think the last time was a year ago and then prior to and I did it for a few days and got it back and then even prior to that was a year probably before that which I did the same thing and then yeah. yesterday yesterday we were all chatting me Emmett and Lucas and we're all like let's you know for our own reasons like we're doing this kicking challenge we should all get our head to toe back by the end of this month and yesterday I was nowhere close and of course my texts to Lucas and, and, and Emmett are like this is awful. This is the worst thing ever. And then today, today I walked in and I said, you know what? Look, I've done this before. I've had it. It actually wasn't that bad. 
let me just let me just go at it today and see how how I do. And I got my head to toe in both legs today after you know a set or so of, of doing the reps, and it was yep. it was a completely different experience. But almost because mm. I decided it was going to be a completely different experience, mm. I said I said I'm not going to experience it that way. This is how I'm going to experience it today. And it came a lot easier than it did yesterday. <laughs> so it was it was it was really it was yep. really interesting. It was really interesting. Um, that I, think whole mental. Just, I think you were just messing with Emmett and I. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I woke up and saw it and I was like, was that today? Cause yesterday you couldn't, you were like, yeah. yeah. I was like, Whoa. Okay. That was good. What, one, of the, um, one of the oh, okay. things that I always say to my students and I try to do it with myself is with your flexibility training, try not to anticipate how it's going to feel. Mm. Try not to anticipate. So part of what you described there, Jeffrey, is anticipating or wanting something. I want to be able to do this. I'm testing this. And then, oh, shit, I can't do it today. So the next day you go in and, oh, yeah, you know, the energy was different. I don't really care so much. And lo and behold, I can do it. But more generally, trying not to anticipate is is difficult for a lot of people, particularly Mm. when they're doing something that in the past has caused them actual pain um, uh, because they don't want to re-experience that. They're anticipating what happened before. And in your case, Jeff, you anticipating, I want to be able to do X. But the body doesn't work like that. The body will do what it can do on that day. And you need to be honest about it. If you push, then you're going to hurt yourself. If you don't push, nothing's going to change. You need to work out um, through experience what the right intensity is, at that time, on that time, no other time, not what happened before or what might happen in the future, but what is happening right now. And that's not the way a lot of people's brains are wired, particularly in the West. They want something or they don't want something. In the body, when we talk about sensation, and Kit's spoken about this at length, the sensation only exists in that exact moment. What happened before was a past sensation. What might happen in the future, you can't, you can anticipate it, but that's a mental activity. Part of the move slowly with full awareness in the body, another way to describe that is how is it feeling right now? That's all there is, not how I want it to feel, how it felt before, the range of movement I could demonstrate six months ago or whatever, but how does it feel right now? That's all there is. It's the only thing that's important. I would say that presence present time experience of only being here right now is probably a skill whether they know it or not that most elite athletes and I just say elite athletes in terms of achievement of whatever it is that they choose to pursue Mm -hmm. is that that's the experience of what they do right um you hear with several athletes of course there's visualization and I want to win and I want to be the best but a lot of them take it day by day and moment by moment um and in strength training I feel is the same way for a lot of people is People fixate on this. In four weeks, I need to be at this weight and I need to be this percentage much more. And it's true for strength and flexibility. I mean, Lucas and I always compare the parallels of the two, right? Which for us is a lot of fun. But, and then, and then they don't, you know, let's just say somebody's going for a deadlift PR. Uh, they, they may hit it, they may not. Hmm. And they don't really focus on it. And they go, you know what? Today I'm going to go into the gym and I'm going to go for a deadlift PR. I'm just going to try it and let's see what happens. And then almost every single time the story you hear is, you won't believe this. I went into the gym today and I hit this obscure PR and I haven't thought about it or I just felt like I should do it today and I did it. And then usually it's some crazy amount more. Like I added 10 kgs. You haven't done deadlift for six weeks. How did you, you know, it's just like, it is almost that acceptance of or taking away from the expectation and just allowing to be there at that moment and experience whatever is going to occur. And then breakthroughs happen. I don't know why, but those breakthroughs occur usually in those times. You don't even expect it. The breakthrough is just even, you know, the emotional release afterwards. I mean, yeah, you're done and it's like, well, I've just felt amazing. I just feel so much better. Mm. Um, and that's, I think, what we're all looking for in a lot of ways too, right? Is that kind of outside of the regular routine of life experience or, you know, release. So, yeah, I think that that's, I, I need to hear that. Olivia, because my side splits are one day they're this and one day they're that. And I'm like, every week I need to be doing active side split work. 
And if I don't, I'm going to lose my game. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think that com- I do have, and uh, Jeff does too. We have that competitive side to us and our flexibility sometimes because of that background. Yeah. I think like I me, mean, you've probably experienced that with your ba- competitive background. Like there's probably moments that you, uh, it doesn't sound like you're as competitive as you used to be, or are you, or. Uh, well, my, my goals have shifted. I'm just mm. in my own body. I'm simply interested in function. Does it feel good? Can I do anything that I want to do with it? Right. Um, and I can. And I, I think that's because I've done, really, I only do foundational stuff. Even though I've done the foundational stuff, I keep doing the foundational stuff so that my body stays robust. Mm-hmm. Um and if something starts to give, you know, like I've had this ongoing problem in my hand for a while, which has stopped me doing handstand work, you know, I just play around and work out what it is that's causing that. I know what the cause is. I spend too much time on the computer. Um, so I, you know, find the technique that you need to, to help you with that. But in terms of do I have particular goals of a particular flexibility move or whatever, not really anymore. I mean, I don't actually do that much stretching, hardly ever. I do some every now and then I'll go yeah I really need to do some hip yesterday I had a lot of tension in my middle back um and even though I know exactly what I need to do I don't do it I don't do it I don't do it and then the tension in my middle back is so much it's like oh shit and all I do is a partner hip flexor stretch with kit and now I feel great today so you know I'm just interested in functioning well that's all I'm interested Mm -hmm. in I'm not involved in any particular sport I'm interested in exploring new techniques to help other people with their flexibility stuff. Um, I'll make one more comment. The restrictions in my body, I believe now, are fascial. They're not muscular and they're not joint-based. And I, I say that because I feel that, because I've had so much experience with stretching that I know the difference between whether this is a a muscular limitation or problem in the joint or whatever. All the restrictions remaining in my body are fascial. And if we come full circle to the main sport that I did for all those years, gymnastics, gymnasts have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of learning to hold, hold tension in parts of the body, to hold a particular shape, to which you then add a dynamic element to. And that pattern of holding is deep in my body and it was learned as a child where there was no context of what that meant. Now the unholding, which is different from going further and improving my range of movement, that's what I'm focused on in my own body, learning how to let go of unnecessary holding. It's not even tension, it's a slightly different thing, but the holding pattern is so practised in my body, it's so unconscious, it's such a habit that now I'm trying to bring that into direct awareness all the time, let that stuff go, because it's not serving me well in terms of functioning well. Describe that really badly, but that that is the individual (laughs) focus right now. That holding pattern is so ingrained in my system All the flexibility and work in the world has helped me undo that to some extent. But actually, and I've been resistant to this for all the time I've known Kit, it's the relaxation part that I need to work on, not the flexibility part, just learning how to be completely relaxed. Would you do that through even exploring meditation? Not meditation too much, just literally lying on the ground and doing nothing relaxing the guided relaxation stuff we do my particular focus is on breath counting just lie there and count breaths so i guess that's a meditation object but just relaxing and it's starting to work for me i can now do that and feel much i can feel like that habit of holding is is letting go something's changing there so that's what i'm personally focused on yeah, that's... A, a funny anecdote i think i think it's really funny Uh, We teach in a fantastic um, gymnastic strength training facility in Sydney most years, and it's our performance workshop. So it's very much oriented to how do I 
improve myself so I can do this position like a split or whatever. And the focus of this session was um, being able to do a full bridge, so a full back bend. So really important it is full shoulder flexion and also thoracic extension. And so we were doing some exercises for to improve shoulder flexion and I was demonstrating it. And even though I described it as um, it will involve some spinal extension as well, thoracic extension, all the people that were from that facility, they just said, oh, my God, you let your ribs flare. You can't possibly do that ever. And I'm like, oh, my God, what's going on? And they all had this massive reaction because, of course, in gymnastics, and I know this, you're taught to pull the ribs in and down because that's the shape you have for the handstand line and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, so are you saying that for the rest of your life you can never let your ribs flare out ever in your life? And the context here is we're trying to improve your shoulder flexibility. But this is my point. People are so trained in a particular way of moving and holding themselves that that becomes a fixation in itself. And, yeah, it was so funny. I just thought... Think about what you're saying there. You're saying that this pattern of holding can never, ever, ever be let go. Um, Mm. I had the same reaction in um, Vancouver I was teaching and I had a couple of yoga teachers and they were taught the same thing, that even in a full bridge, you were never, ever allowed to let your ribs flare. And I'm like, how is that even anatomically possible to do that? That's the whole point of a bridge is full movement. Anyway, very funny. We, We all get very fixated on on certain things it was so funny i'm yeah, like you gotta thrash your shoulder in order to do a bridge just because you're not allowed to let your ribs flare to get more shoulder <laughs> movement yeah it was so funny no yeah. no i'm not dissing those people it was just it was a very good teaching moment mm-hmm. yeah where the mind right. i mean constraint right yeah. you're 100 i mean the knees over toes the no rounding your oh. back always neutral spine even yeah. even the posture oh. the shoulders back and down all the time thing i mean these actually have we are now starting to realize, and I don't say we, because to me, I mean, it's just a common sense thing. I don't care what the science says or what a therapist says or anything. Like being fixed in one position all day is not good for anybody, no matter what the position is. Yeah. Um, but we find that, right? Like, man, my back and my shoulder, my neck, like, well, what, what do you do? Well, my, my Cairo told me that I'm always supposed to, you know, I wear this thing around my shoulders now where my shoulders are always fixed back. And mm-hmm. like, you actually don't, like shoulders forwards, bat. It's, you know, of course we deal with the knees over toes still to this day. Oh my God, how dare you train your knees over your toes? Oh my God, how dare you do a Jefferson curl? Those are terrible for your back. You're going to blow out your disc. You mm-hmm. know, how dare you do a squat with some extension versus it being neutral and only like, you know, I mean, we, I mean, look at this, I deal with this all the time. Yeah. <laughs> all the time, all the time, all the time. So do we. It's that same, what about, what about this? all these potential yeah. things that could go wrong and they could happen. You know, people do hurt themselves doing things, but again, go back to the approach. If you're moving with full awareness in your body, your body will not let you hurt itself. It just right. won't. Yeah. yeah. It won't. I always, I always like the uh, demonstration of, you know, just standing on, I guess the outside of your feet in front of somebody and just like saying like, you know, why is this not okay? My, I'm not allowed to do this Hmm. because I'm going to hurt myself. But what if I found a way to progressively do this and strengthen that so that when I do roll my ankle, nothing happens. (laughs) And And not everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It's that thought process that, well, it moves that way, but you shouldn't move that way. Mm. I mean, deer should not fly either. We're dealing with this whole new wave of trainers now that like, how dare you train? How dare you train these patterns in which you might be, you, you know, you might go into it. Like basically they're saying like, if you train that way, then you're automatically, now your body's going to do that as an instinct, because now you're training that pattern into your brain, which is like a whole nother subject. Cause we know we don't even, tra- we know we don't train patterns into our brain. It's not how the body works. It's not how the brain works, but mm. it's interesting, you know, cause there was a lot of that. Edo of course made that very popular, like get strengthen whatever might be vulnerable in your body and in, in so it's ready for the moment that it goes into that position. But then you get, mm. now you're getting these guys that we say like, well, if you train that position, that's what your body's going to do anyway. Well, it's, it's like, it's like saying that you have some prediction over the football f- player that you're training 
in the sh- and where his shoulder is going to end up randomly in the middle of, again, this highly variable sport at any time, his shoulder can be put in almost any single position. Why would you not be ready for that? Why would you not want to be as ready for that as you possibly can? You know, yeah. especially for those guys, you're looking at making your feeding your family or not off of, even though this might be some dumb sport or something, you know, but that's how you make your living. Like I would think you would want to invest as much into preparing for that as you possibly could. Mm-hmm. So but that's just, that's how we think. And that's why we, what we do versus what others do. So we just try to focus on what we do. Mm. Yeah. But it is an interesting, these fixed yeah. positions that the body is supposed to be in. Like, yeah. Who comes up with these things? <laughs> well, the funniest thing we find is someone will come, like a student in a class or someone that comes to our teacher training program and they'll say, well, I was told X. And you're like, okay, well, did you ask what the reason behind that was? No. I was just told X and I've just taken that on board and now that's what I understand. But there's no understanding there. There's no questioning. We Mm -hmm. get our students to question everything. Everything I've said in this talk, you know, you could disagree with it violently. I don't care. This is my experience. This is what I have found. That's my approach. If you tell me something different, I'll try that out and see how it works out. That's the approach. Don't take anything on faith. And this Absolutely. is the beauty of people like Emmett that you mentioned and Yuri and all those people. They're not dogmatic. They're not worried. They've all gone through all of these processes in their own body and then they've practiced it and tried it out with lots and lots of people and they use what works. Mm-hmm. That's it. Whereas there's plenty of other people in our field who are extremely dogmatic. So this is the only approach. I invented this. This is the way to do it. If you come across someone like that, mm, big question mark. We, do, we don't deal with those people, do we? <laughs> <laughs> well, we try not I to. I don't, I, mean, I don't know what you're talking I'll, about. I'll entertain them, right? Like, <laughs> all right, let's have the discussion. Let's talk about it. And... <laughs> not naming but. any names, but there's, there's always people like that in any field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. It, it, it is always interesting to me, and I don't know, I might die with, wondering why this is but again these kids these people come to us well stretching is bad and and then they finally experience stretching you know through me or through our system and 4,500 athletes not including the athletes I work and people I worked with for six or seven years prior to that Mm. I've never heard anybody complain about getting more flexible Mm -hmm. I've never had that complaint ever I've never had somebody go wow I'm really experiencing all these issues from this range of motion that I developed in my body like what a terrible thing um, yeah. it's never happened it's never happened it's never happened yeah from, from the most elite athlete to grandmas not a single mm-hmm. one of them has ever complained ever about improving the range of motion yeah i would, I would agree yeah, yeah, yeah same I, thing you could say the same right yeah yeah absolutely yeah. well um yeah that was um, amazing olivia I, I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and chat shop with us like so to speak jeff and i we do this a lot where we just kind of start talking and sometimes we just go live on instagram and just talk and we just found out the other day that instagram live is only an hour yeah so, so we, got, <laughs> we got cut off we were just talking shop <laughs> it just turned off on us we were like oh man we were just going That's i didn't true. even know we were let's, talking for an hour part two let's finish this thing yeah like we'll <laughs> yeah. we'll do that we'll have these conversations um and these are the important conversations, right? Because this is where all the gold comes in, mm-hmm. especially for us. Like, yeah, we practice and teach this a lot and we implement it, but we, like you said, me and Lucas learn every day. And that's like really mm-hmm. the, the most amazing part about this is, is learning something new every day. And um, yeah. we start having these conversations and we start riffing and we realize like, and oh, we need to record this. We, like, we need to, rec- <laughs> we need to, we need to put this somewhere because mm-hmm that's what those ideas kind of come and then they go and then you go, man, what was that thing that we were, you know? And it's like, now it's with the internet and the ability to have this and talk with people all around the world. And, you know, these ideas come and and to, to hear these different methods and it's, it's such, it's been such an incredible experience for us. So we're very grateful for having you. Very grateful. Well, thanks for having me on. It's really good to chat to you guys. Yeah. I got a couple of pages here notes to go through afterwards and just revisit what we talked about, but, (laughs) No, it was great. Um, yeah. And for those that are listening, um, like if you haven't, I mean, if you have been following Jeff and I, then you, you know, to check out stretch therapy, but it's stretch 
to find out more um, about what Olivia is all about and Kit Laughlin, who was on two episodes ago. And hopefully we will get together soon and do another one or maybe just come up with some cool collaboration of some sorts. Fantastic. Yeah. Great. Right. Something in. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Olivia. Okay.